Um, so hello everybody, um, I'm Genova Messiah um, and I'm a Heritage Officer at Tower Hamlet's Local History Library and Archives. Um, I'm joined today by Rosa Schling from a co-director for On the Record, um, an oral history non-profit organisation and Joy Hastings, a retired infant feeding manager for Tower Hamlet and vice chair of the Breastfeeding Network. Uh, this event is part of London Challenge Poverty Week uh, and sponsored by 4 in 10, which is a London Children's Poverty Network. Um, Rosa has been delivering a great project called Grow Your Own, uh, which has led to this event being hosted this evening. Uh, I worked on a podcast episode uh, in a series of episodes about challenges within childcare, which led me to interview Joy for the podcast. I'll be sharing a little snippet of the podcast later. Um, but for those that don't know about the amazing project being delivered by Rosa and on the record, I'll hand over to her for a little bit more details. So over to you, Rosa. Thank you, Genova. Yeah, so I'm just going to tell you quickly a little bit more about the childcare history project, um, Grow Your Own, which we're running, which um, Genova just told you about. So I've got <clears throat> a little, uh, few, just a few things to show you here um so this our contact information's here i'll put it in the chat um a bit later as well and so you can read more about the project if you want um but basically we're a history project um that's recording and sharing past experiences of organizing for better childcare, um and part of what we're doing a really important part of what we're doing is trying to share what we record directly with people concerned with childcare today and people who are trying to create a better system a better childcare system for everyone today and um that's Genova was an important part of the project already which was um by making a podcast which I'll tell you a bit more about in a moment but first I'll tell you about the kinds of history that we are recording. We've been going for a year already and we have one more year to go. So we've already collected a certain amount of material. We've recorded oral history interviews and we've looked in what's already held in archives and we're collecting new archives too. And we've been recording stories from grassroots childcare projects. So it includes community nurseries, Childcare cooperatives, playgroups, um, after school and holiday childcare, childminder groups, and children's centres. And a lot of these things started to be created in the 1960s and even more in the 1970s. Um, and when there was a real sort of wave of grassroots community action that created a lot of childcare projects, basically because there wasn't much childcare out there at all. And um, it was very difficult for people who wanted to go to work or wanted their children to socialize um, and and to have any kind of care outside of a home. So a lot of the um, childcare infrastructure that we are used to having now was created in that time period. And um, then, and we're also looking at campaigns for improvements to childcare, um, which include things like calling for more funding, um, for state provision and for um, different kinds of training for childcare workers. <laughs> um, I've been invaded by a cat, sorry. <laughs> um, and we're also looking at times when childcare workers have organised for better conditions. So some of these photographs I've got on this slide, I've, there's a leaflet from a national childcare campaign. There's a photograph of Market Nursery, which was a community nursery in Hackney. And they're um, on some kind of protest, I think probably at Hackney Town Hall in this photograph with their children. And at the bottom, there's a photograph of a 1984 nursery workers strike in the London Borough of Islington, which is where all of the council employed nursery workers in the council nurseries um, went on indefinite strike. And they were actually striking about being given too many children to look after and having too high a ratio of children to workers and they managed to um, get the council to employ enough workers so that they had a lower ratio of children as, as a result of that strike. I thought I'd play you a clip from one of the oral history interviews as just an example of some of the stories we've collected. Um, so this is Jenny Williams who's one of the people 
we interviewed and actually I think part of this this clip is actually used in our latest podcast which came out this week which is on no recourse to public funds and she's talking about um how when she was actually she went back to university as a student um at some point in the 1970s and she went to the University of Middlesex and there was and she was already a someone who'd organized for childcare in her area, which was North Kensington. So at the university with other students, she's helped to set up a nursery. Um, so she's talking about how they campaigned for a nursery at the University of Middlesex in this clip. Lots of people from mostly West Africa, actually, but a lot of parents and uh, they had, because they had no means of uh, looking, having the children cared for, they were sent to foster parents. And a lot of the parents were really worried about this because they were mostly white foster parents and they weren't getting to see their children because they were very often really far away from where they were actually living. And so we started this campaign and we had a very, very... I suppose you could say active group who were on this trade union studies and they were mostly men but they were mostly men from uh, areas of I mean all over Britain which had become they'd become basically redundant I mean like steel workers and people like that yeah. um, who decided that they were going to study industrial relations and you know it's one of the reasons for going there it was a, it had this very good industrial relations course with a lot of really interesting tutors on it so we actually sort of started working with them and and having this campaign so it was lovely because it wasn't just these feminist women it was these guys as well who did actually appreciate why we needed it and uh, what we of course we did in those days was we occupied everything all the time and so we occupy, and well, I tell you, it was quite funny. We ha we had this debate, and that we were going to basically push for this uh, nursery, and we had a space identified, and we I sort of worked out the cost. We knew how much it was costing and everything, and the directorate were just in tap transigent. They didn't want to know. So um, I always remember on the Friday evening, um, we were approached by the um, another sort of political group saying we don't think the time is quite ready and I said well tough on Monday morning um, we're going to occupy the director's office and I said and anyway um, most of the guys gone home and uh, you know the decision's been taken <laughs> and it was always very funny because what, what they had done is that they had talked to all the caretaking staff so caretaking staff knew what was happening and we did, we all kind of, there's this picture in the Guardian of all of us sitting in the director's office waiting for a, an agreement. And we eventually got an agreement and we had a nursery set up. And it was it was um, right in the middle of the building, actually, another porter cabin, you know, I think. Uh, and what was really sad was that uh, some of the children, you hadn't seen their parents for like three months. And so we had loads of tears because parents, you know, were bringing their children in. And it was it was really, really, it, it, you appreciated that you were doing something positive. That's just an example of the kind of stories we're collecting um, in the project. And lots of people. Oh, sorry. Um, and what we're going to do with it all is we've made this podcast series, which is being released right now, which, as we said, Genova made one brilliant episode of, which you'll hear a little bit from later. But you can listen to all of the episodes. It's called Childcare Voices, and I'll put a link for the series in the chat as well. Um, there's We're also going to make um, a digital map of childcare campaigns and projects which will show all of London and you'll be able to see where as many as we found out about so obviously probably not all of them but you'll be able to see some childcare history on that map so you'll see where there were community nurseries where there were campaigns where there were nurseries set up in universities and colleges like Jenny was talking about um <clears throat> And and there'll be Tower Hamlet specific places on that map, definitely, because we're finding out about lots in Tower Hamlets. Um, and we're going to make a campaigner's toolkit and a stay and play re resource. So 
that's most of what I want to say. I'm going to play you this, which is a trailer for one of the other podcast episodes as well. So this is the second episode, which was on single parents. It was made by someone called Ruth Talbot. Hello, I'm Ruth, a single mother of three and a campaigner on all things single parent rights. In this podcast, I'm going to look at how single parents are coping with the lack of affordable childcare in London and across the UK, and how government policies towards single parents have changed over the past six decades. What do we want? So each episode looks at a different issue that's important to that particular person and also investigates the sort of past of the issue that they that they face. So thank you. And here's some links so you can stay in touch or find out more about the project. And again, I'll put those in the chat. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Rosa. Um, it's been great to be a part of the project. Um, it, I really enjoyed making the podcast. <laughs> um, I'm now going to share my screen. Um, so everyone can see that, right? So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the library and archives a bit about our collections um so if you're not familiar with us oh, oh, there, we are. there we are so uh this is our building um and we are on bancroft road and we have been here since 1861 uh, it was originally built as a town hall um, but has been a public library since 1901. Um, it had uh, an adult lending library, a children's library, and the local history um, reference library in the same building up until 2001 um, with the creation of the idea stores. And now um, it's just the library and archives that um, are held in this building. So we collect, um, preserve, and make accessible um, a number of topics um, all relating to Tower Hamlets. Um, topics such as uh, women, politics, um, activism, um, education, uh, employment, housing. Um, so yeah, that's just some of the uh, topics that we cover, many more, as long as it comes under the boundaries of Tower Hamlets. Um, uh, this is our uh, reading room or research room um, located on the first floor. Um, Anybody can come and um, access the collections. All you have to do is fill out an online uh, registration form. And yeah, we're open three days a week um, and two uh, Saturdays a month. So we are a, a library uh, and an archive. Uh, so our library collection um, consists of over 20,000 books and pamphlets. Uh, 25,000 images, photographs, illustrations, um, around 4,000 maps, um, audiovisual material, um, sound, music, um, newspapers, um, bound and cuttings as well. Um, our archive collections consist of um, individuals and personal archives. We have archives um, business of businesses. We also have uh, archives of places of worship, schools, organizations, societies, and we also have a great oral history collection as well. So um, just a little bit about um, our library collections. So um, when I was doing research for the podcast, I came across um, some bound volumes um, of Tower Hamlet's parent and baby uh, group, um, which was also known as the National Children's Trust or NCT local group and it featured um, advertisements, um, also a lot of guidance, and there were also contact numbers for uh, postnatal support workers and breastfeeding counsellors as well. And this is how I came across um, Joy Hastings' name. Um, so when I was doing my research, her name came up quite a lot in these bound volumes in the late 80s um, um, newsletters that were circulated and it was just really interesting to see um, the support that women 
were able to access um, during the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, so when I saw Joy's, Joy's name come up quite often, I um, got into contact with her um, just by luck. I, was I managed to find her and um, yeah, she was really wonderful in uh, allowing me to interview her for the podcast and um, how great that she still lives in the borough and she's still kind of supporting women um, to this to this day. Um, so this is these are two images. Um, on the left we have um, a wonderful collection that Joy has deposited with the archives. Um, it consists of um, some newspapers, cuttings, we've got some journals, um, some pamphlets and some uh, guidance booklets or um, that Joy has collected over time and um, just shows kind of the um, support that she's been given to women over the years. Um, we also have um, a wonderful uh, oral history recording from Joy as well about her uh, long career in the borough and that will be available to listen to in our reading room very soon. Um, yeah, so it's really great that we've been able to kind of expand on our collections um, in this area. So um, the Eva Armsby Centre, so we have some collections relating to the Eva Armsby, Armsby Centre, which was opened on in March 1993, and it opened to facilitate the care of children under the Children's Act of um, 1989. And um, Joy will go into more detail about this, I'm sure, about the the uh, breastfeeding groups that were set up in the in the 90s. And um, Eva Armsby was the first. Um, female uh, mayor of Tower Hamlets from um, 1979 to 1980. Um, so that's why uh, the centre has that name. And there's also some collections about um, the opening of the centre. Um, and there's also some collections about Eva Armsby herself. So that's just a little bit about what we do at the archives and kind of the collections that we hold. So I'm going to stop talking now and hand over to Joy. Um, I'm going to stop sharing this presentation. There we go. If I see that. There we are. Right. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I can see some friendly, can't see the faces, but I can see some friendly names. So thanks for coming to listen to me. Um, I was absolutely amazed when Genova contacted me and said that she had all these records uh, from the NCT days <laughs> in the 1980s. Um, and my name, when she showed me them and I looked, I thought my name appeared probably rather more <laughs> too many times. Uh, but anyway, there it is. And uh, amazingly, I am still doing very similar things today. So infant feeding I mean, to be involved in this subject for so long, it's obviously a huge passion of mine. I uh, very much enjoy working with families and their babies and sometimes older children as well. And yeah, so I'm really pleased to be able to share some of my thoughts. Now, this is quite a brief talk, so I can't go into every detail. Some of you who know things might feel that I'm missing some things out, but I'll try to fit in as much as possible. Also with the idea that this is a recording so people will listen to it afterwards and then maybe they will be interested in some of the topics. Okay, next slide, Genova. So this is what I'm covering today, um, a bit about myself a brief history of infant feeding in the UK, a bit about why breastfeed and why it's important, and then talking about what support there is in Tower Hamlets. Next one. 
So there are a few pictures from my life. Um, I think it's quite interesting to sometimes find out where people are coming from when they have a passion for this particular topic. So uh, the first picture is a picture of me as a baby with my mum. Uh, that would have been taken in the late 1950s. <laughs> and I was a breastfed baby. And I think that's quite relevant because if you come from a family where breastfeeding is normal and everybody does it in the family, then you're much more likely to go on to breastfeed yourself. So that was my background. I always heard breastfeeding being talked about positively and I saw some relatives breastfeed. So that definitely impacted on me to the extent that um, in the next picture, you see me as an 18 year old student nurse. Uh, when I started working, uh, training at the Royal London Hospital, that was only the London Hospital in those days. And when I, as a student nurse, I went on to the postnatal ward and I just absolutely loved it. I just thought it was the most wonderful thing to be with mothers and babies. I was lucky. I mean, it was, we're talking now about the late 70s and definitely breastfeeding rates were dropping in general, but the sister on the postnatal ward when I was a student was very positive about breastfeeding. So I think that also had an impact on me. I then, from being a nurse, I went on to train as a midwife. And during my midwifery training and as a sort of fairly new midwife, Again, everyone very positive about breastfeeding, but that's when I think I really began to realise that the knowledge that I had as a, a new midwife in sort of the late 70s, early 80s, was not really enough to help all women to, to meet their breastfeeding goals. Um, so I found it a bit frustrating. You know, I really, really wanted to help mums to, to breastfeed if they wanted to do it. But I, I just felt there was knowledge lacking there. Um, so that was backed up. That's me with my first baby and the first picture. So that was in 1983. And then my second baby in 1986. So I breastfed both of those babies. Um, I went to NCT classes because I thought it'd be really interesting to see what NCT classes were like. And at the postnatal group after the NCT grass uh, classes, I met my one of my lifelong friends. She was training to be a breastfeeding counsellor. And she said, why don't you train to be a breastfeeding counsellor? So that's what I did. And I qualified just before the baby in picture two, in picture, um, the next picture was born. So I volunteered as a breastfeeding counsellor. My phone number was out there. And I, um, you know, did what I could to support mums over the phone to the extent that when I went back to work as a midwife, um, I sort of became known as one of the midwives who, who was able to help other mothers breastfeed. So I obviously learnt a lot as training to be a breastfeeding counsellor, learnt through having my own two babies and, um, you know, became a real interest of mine. And I sort of hooked up with the other midwives who had a particular interest in breastfeeding and we got together um, to start the work in, in Tower Hamlets. I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail later so I won't go into that in uh, detail now but I couldn't resist this opportunity to show my four uh, grandbabies. <laughs> um, they were all breastfed and I found it a fascinating experience to learn, know about the breastfeeding journey from start to finish um, for my daughter and my daughter-in-law. Uh, it's a privilege because you, when you help mothers to breastfeed, you only often, you know, you have a small part that you, uh, that you're, that you know about. You don't know their whole journey. So to have, to be able to look at the journey of my daughter and daughter-in-law was very special. And, um, they're now nine and seven, and I don't quite know if they mind having their photos shown like this, but I don't suppose they'll mind. 
Um, the other two pictures, one is um, me helping a mum, and the other one is the two two other uh, baby friendly coordinators in Tower Hamlets that I'll be talking about in a bit. Right, thank you. Next slide, Genova. Okay, so I think it's important to think about the history of infant feeding. Now, this really is very brief. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more detail we could go on to, but when we think of how the human race evolved, in the beginning, we were hunter-gatherers. And what I think is really important is that babies have not really evolved since these times. When agriculture started, that was about 10,000 years ago, then families stayed more in one place. Um, and they often wanted to have quite a lot of children to work on the land. And because they'd made the connection between breastfeeding and not getting pregnant, sometimes that started to restrict breastfeeding a bit so they could have more children to help them work the land. So that was uh, that lasted for obviously for a long time, but it meant that people started looking at thinking about are there other ways we can feed our babies? And one of the very obvious ways was to get somebody else to feed your baby for you. Um, and that's what we call wet nursing. Um, that's been going on forever. Sometimes it was a life-saving, well, often, usually it was a life-saving thing, but it could be because maybe because the mother died or for other reasons couldn't look after her baby. So someone else would step in and feed the baby. Um, it then became, became something that more wealthier women would pay for to have somebody come into the family and be the wet nurse. So sometimes it could be a positive experience for wet nurses. It was a job. Um, they often fed baby after baby after baby and were part of the family. Um, but also, obviously, it could be a negative experience for the wet nurse. So maybe she had to leave her own baby behind to feed another woman's baby. And, you know, there was a lot of opportunity for exploitation and for women who were poor to, to be exploited by richer women. So it was a, you know, a mixed bag. It could be positive or it could be negative. Now, when the Industrial Revolution happened, um, that's when there was even more of a drive to look for a replacement for breastfeeding because mothers, you know, people joined, started to come into towns and women had to work, sometimes long hours, and they were looking for something else to feed, to feed their babies. Um, this often led to a, an increase in both maternal and infant mortality. There's an example from Dublin, where in a hospital, over 10,000 babies were fed on pap, which is either cereal or bread mixed with cow's milk or and some sort of animal milk um, and out of those 10 over 10,000 babies 99% died so that's a real you know terrible example of um, trying to replace breastfeeding with something that really doesn't work so people obviously looking for an improvement for that circumstances and Unfortunately, or fortunately, maybe in some cases at this time, uh, the medical profession started to get involved with infant feeding. And I've got a quote here from a James Cadogan, who wrote in 1748, it is with great pleasure I see at last the preservation of children become the care of men of sense. In my opinion, this business has been too long fatally left to the management of women who cannot be supposed to have a proper knowledge to fit them for the task. So there we have it where the men are thinking that they know better than how mothers have been feeding their babies for generations. They started to write books. They started to produce formulas of how to change cow's milk uh, as they thought, to be a bit more like breast milk. Um, and that's why we still call it formula milk today, because of the formulas that the doctors wrote um, in times gone by. And in the books, there was often this feeling that babies were overfed by mothers. They were fed too much. So they started to bring in scheduling. 
and they started to want mothers to only feed their babies every few hours. And of course, the outcome of that is that the babies aren't very happy. They cry a lot. The mother's milk supply drops because the baby's not being fed as often as it needs to be. The mothers lose confidence. And again, they're looking for something else that they can give their babies um, because they feel that their breast milk isn't enough. And in fact, very interestingly, um, when I put the advert for this on Facebook, a friend of mine wrote that when she was in the late 50s, when she was born, she only weighed five pounds. And the doctors would, the doctor told her mum to only feed her every four hours. So she was a very miserable, unhappy baby. She cried a lot. Her mum was despairing. And it was just an awful experience for both of them. So that's a direct result through the years of doctors, men becoming involved in infant feeding and feeling that they know they know better. Um, and hopefully things have turned around a bit since those times, but unfortunately some, not always, <laughs> not in all circumstances. Also, at the times when they were making these different milks, there was a cow's milk surplus. And when there's a surplus of something, the people who own the surplus are always trying to um, find something to do with it, to make money from it. So that was another reason why um, formula made from cow's milk became uh, very popular. Um, so as the 20th century um, went on, the breastfeeding rate started to drop. And after the Second World War, in 1948, 40% of babies were breastfed. So that's less than half. But by the 60s, only 6% of babies were breastfed. So it really did plummet. And um, ironically, then the medical profession started to get a bit concerned the babies weren't being breastfed because they could see that there were more hospital admissions and there were more problems with babies. And this was a worldwide issue. Um, so the World Health Organization um, looked at trying to improve breastfeeding rates. And one of the things they looked at was the marketing of breast milk substitutes. And they produced a, a WHO code which we still aim to abide by today. But unfortunately, it, it didn't have to be law in every country. So the UK took some of it into law, but not all of it. Um, so the idea is that it stops bad practices from these companies who are only trying to make money. So they don't want, you know, they're not allowed to give out free formula to mothers to sort of entice them in um, to buy the product later. Uh, they shouldn't give freebies to health professionals. So, and they shouldn't make false claims about their product. So that's still in force today, um, but it's been watered down in some cases. So for instance, in the UK, there's no advertising of infant formula for babies under the age of six months. But what did the formula companies do? They thought, well, will produce a formula that's to be given to babies over the age of six months. So they called it follow on milk and they branded it exactly the same as the first milk um, so that they could advertise it without breaking the law. And if when research is done, mothers often think they've seen an advert for formula milk, but it's actually for follow on milk, which is from six, six months onwards. And there's a general consensus that we, that follow on milk isn't needed. Um, it's If you are bottle feeding, it's perfectly okay to give the formula milk, stage one formula milk until the baby's a year old. There's no need to have this follow on milk product, which was only invented to circumnavigate the law. So the companies are always trying to find ways of getting around the law. They spend many millions of pounds and you know it's very hard to um, go against that. So every five years, the government was doing a infant feeding survey. The last one is 2010, and I'm pleased to say there, there is going to be another one soon, but we have had a gap in the data since 2010. But in 2010, 
81% of mothers started breastfeeding. And, you know, that's a, an amazing figure. That's the vast majority of women wanting to breastfeed. Um, but by one week, that's gone down by 6%. And then by six weeks, only 55% of women are still giving breast milk. That was in 2010. So it drops quickly. Um, the women who are most likely to breastfeed are older. They're from minority ethnic groups. They've been in education for longer. They're professional or managerial professions, and they live in the least deprived areas. So, you, you know, that's an important thing to be aware of. There were improvements in the breastfeeding rates before they stopped the survey. So the 2005 survey wasn't as good as the 2010 survey. So it showed that government investment in breastfeeding support was starting to work. And I'll be talking about that in a minute. Um, so that's a good thing. But we haven't actually got the data to really prove that it carried on improving. And our Tower Hamlets data also shows an increase after the breastfeeding, structured breastfeeding support was put into place. And I did find out the current Royal London Hospital rates, which are that on discharge from hospital, 85% um, of babies are being exclusively breastfed or are having some breast milk. So that's quite a high figure, that's reassuring. Um, and our aim is always to try to help those mothers who want to breastfeed to be able to do so. Uh, next slide. So just thinking in general about why do women want to breastfeed? It is a natural progression from pregnancy, sometimes called the fourth trimester. Your breasts get ready for breastfeeding. It's one of the very early signs of pregnancy. And it just seems to, you know, it's what nature intended women to do, that the, the breasts would get ready um, to produce milk for the baby. As I said before, for often if you come from a family of breastfeeders, you grow up feeling that breastfeeding is the thing to do. And many women can't always put it into words. They just believe and it's often nothing that we actually do. So those of us who really want to support moms who want to breastfeed, we can't make them breastfeed. We can't put that want into them. They just have it. And as I said, often they can't put it into words why they want to breastfeed, but they do. Um, so, it's, you know, you can't bash people over the head and make them breastfeed. You, it just comes from the mother. And, you know, we, we aim to support those mothers who want to breastfeed. If people don't feel they want to breastfeed, then, you know, that's absolutely their decision. And we support them to do look after their babies however they choose to do so. If you see your friends and family enjoy breastfeeding, that's important. Um, and also it is cheaper, although people would say, well, you need to make sure you're eating well. But in this country, um, maybe not very recently, uh, you know, most women do get enough to eat and it's easier in certain ways. It, it's intensive to begin with and mothers need that help to get through that intensive time and go on to find it easier, easier to breastfeed. Uh, next one. However, we know it doesn't always work out. And partner and family, these are in no particular order, by the way. They were just how it they came out of my brain. <laughs> um, partner and family not supportive. That's a big thing because, you know, the mums only have contact with us on a, a very small period of time, but they're with their families and partners for much longer. And if their family and partners are negative about breastfeeding, it's a very undermining drip drip effect. And it's very hard for women to carry on feeding sometimes when they just don't have that support. Health professionals, you may think that health professionals should all be supportive of breastfeeding because of the health 
um, advantages. But again, some health professionals are humans, so they're affected by their own feeding experiences, which might make them negative about feeding. And not all health professionals have, they should all have been trained, but they may not have taken the training on board as much as they should. And they aren't as supportive as you hoped, hoped they would be. I've already spoken about formula advertising and marketing. And then there's the social media, which is huge now. So there's lots of social media for new mothers and celebrities post about their experiences. And then we know that there's not enough skilled support. It's um, definitely a postcode lottery. So it rather depends on where you live, whether you get the skilled support you need to get you through the first days and weeks when you're learning. So something that was lost when women started to feed, to not breastfeed, was that very quickly that mother-to-mother -mother knowledge and support was lost. So if your mum had breastfed and your grandmother had breastfed and your aunties had breastfed, they could all help you to breastfeed because they've done it themselves and, you know, they had tips and tricks and, you know, they, they could help you. But that knowledge was lost very quickly and it's um if you're supported by your mother or your mother-in-law who has bottle fed their baby because it's a different experience babies react differently when they're bottle fed um then it's if you you can't just make a direct correlation between bottle feeding and breastfeeding the babies behave differently and then, of course, his mother's in pain or she feels that her milk isn't enough. And that can generally be her not understanding normal baby behaviour. So there's basically lots of different reasons why breastfeeding is not always as successful as the mother would like. Next slide. So mothers in general need positive information during education while they're growing up. Um, if they're not lucky enough to come from a breastfeeding family, then if they can have some contact and information while they're at school, while they're young, that can be very helpful. And there have been various programmes over the country. But again, postcode lottery, um, some children won't get any education at all. Once you're pregnant, you need the antenatal preparation, and that's for mums and their partners, um, and learning about the realities of new parenthood. There is still sometimes a rose-coloured um, expectation that feeding a baby is going to be natural and normal and lovely, and then, you know, mothers, parents need to have a, a, um, a realistic expectation of what it's going to be like. To support them, whoever it is, needs to be knowledgeable, empathetic and non-judgmental. That support around the, the, the family is very important. Um, and then we do have um, the UNICEF UK Baby Friendly Initiative. So this is a initiative to, it's a worldwide initiative to ensure particularly worldwide it's, it's hospitals to make sure that they have standards that have to be met in the care of mothers and babies. But in the UK, we also include community facilities. So that means that all health professionals who come into contact with parents should be um, trained to a certain standard and should adhere to certain policy. Um, so that's great if a mother can give birth in a baby friendly hospital and be looked after by um, people who have had the proper training. Um, the other thing that we find in a way to replace the mother to mother support that was just natural um, is peer support from other mothers. And if there's quite a few different training programs that happen in Tower Hamlets, we have the breastfeeding network training and we train women who've breastfed to support other mothers and that's really helpful to know that you're being supported by somebody who's gone through the same experience and of course maternity leave is very important so that parents have got some um, time to you know be with their baby and look after their baby 
Okay, next one. So is breast best? Um, that's a common term, but actually not one we use now. Um, I put it there just because it's still said quite a lot. But we like we prefer to think that breastfeeding is just normal and therefore everything has everything that the baby needs for optimal growth and development. Uh, the UNICEF UK Baby Friendly Initiative says there's resounding evidence that breastfeeding saves lives, improves health and cuts costs in every country worldwide. So not just the developing countries, but all countries, including ours. Um, it protects children from various illnesses, including infections, diabetes, asthma, heart disease, obesity, um, as well as cot death, sudden infant death syndrome. And for mother's health, it protects mothers from breast and ovarian cancers and heart disease. And it also supports the mother-baby relationship and the mental health of both baby and mother. And that's why it's vital that women who want to breastfeed are supported to do so. Because if women who really want to breastfeed don't manage it, then that can be quite detrimental to that relationship. And it also reduces hospital admissions and GP consultations. And at the end, I've got the research uh, links to these um, this list. Next one. OK, so Tower Hamlets. Here we are in Tower Hamlets. Um, Trevor has already said about the National Childbirth Trust breastfeeding counsellors was to mums in the 90s. Always the midwives and health visitors are around to support mums. And at the Royal London, for a long, long time, we've had the neonatal breastfeeding specialists who support mothers in the um, neonatal unit. And they continue to do so. But in, um, in the late 90s, people started setting up breastfeeding groups. So that group of midwives and health visitors who I was in touch with when I went back to work as a midwife, we got together with some of the mothers from the community and we set up, um, you know, one of the first breastfeeding groups in the country. And that was at the Eva Armsby Centre, as Genova, Genova was talking about. And it was a very popular group. It was once a week, very well attended and very successful. And as part of that, it led to a specialist midwife post that myself and my job share um, took on in the late 90s. And for that, we were writing policies and training staff. And then an amazing thing happened in the UK. Sure Starts began. So this was a wonderful thing for infant feeding because it... Um, it had breastfeeding support as one of its aims. So in 2001, we were lucky because the first short start was in the same area as the Eva Armsby Centre. Breastfeeding support worker, particularly from the um, a bilingual worker who could uh, support the Bangladeshi community in Tower Hamlets, and they would support the mums in the hospital and go to do home visits as well. And then as each new short start began, we um, uh, we started employing a, um, a new support worker in each post. So this became the Tower Hamlet's Breastfeeding Project. That's an early picture of members of the team and myself there in the background and my job share there in the middle. And in 2006, this went, went Tower Hamlets wide. And then that was shortly followed by 2008 when the Royal London and the Tower Hamlets community started working towards the baby friendly accreditation with UNICEF UK. And that was a public health initiative. Um, and that continues to today. Next slide. So, all hospital and community staff are trained to meet the baby friendly standards. Alongside that, the breastfeeding project in those days um, and still today was providing antenatal classes, help on the postnatal ward, phone calls to all new mothers, home visits, six days a week breastfeeding groups and training for volunteers. 
And the breastfeeding support workers were trained with the breastfeeding network and they included bilingual Bengali, Saleti and Somali speakers. And here we all are in 2013 when the Royal London Hospital and the Tower Hamlets Community Services were accredited as baby friendly. So that was a big cause for celebration. Next slide. Um, and then more up to date, in the last few years, the Breastfeeding Project changed its name to the Baby Feeding Service. And that was very much um, because we were very keen to support all mothers. We always had done, but when you're called a breastfeeding support worker, it's quite difficult to go up to a mum who's bottle feeding and says, do you want support? So the team became baby feeding specialists, which also acknowledged their um, experience and knowledge. And it meant it was perhaps easier to approach mums who were choosing to bottle feed. And, it, you know, it gave a better um, support for all mothers um, because actually bottle feeding, you know, people think it's quite easy to bottle feed, but actually there's new research which shows it's better if um, bottle feeding is paced, you know, slowed down, trying not to overfeed babies on the bottle, et cetera, et cetera. And the team, the baby feeding service is now with Tower Hamlets Council and, you know, has continued to evolve. So now, for instance, there's more appointment only clinics, which enables more mothers to be seen. And this is a picture of the team as it was when I retired um, three years ago. <laughs> so, um, yeah, very happy memories of that service. Next page. So I did want to do a shout out because very soon, maybe in January, but I think that needs to be confirmed, um, the Tower Hamlets is starting another training course for mothers who have breastfed to join a free training course to become a breastfeeding helper with the Breastfeeding Network. And that's a very popular course um, which helps women to volunteer both in the hospital and in groups. And in the picture there is taken some time ago, um, a group of Tower Hamlet's mums who have trained to be volunteers. And that's the, um, Chloe is the name of the uh, volunteer coordinator who you can contact if you're interested in that training. And then finally, there are some websites and references. I mean, this page could go on and on, um, but the Breastfeeding Network, just because that's what we're most closely associated with in Tower Hamlets, um, a very important service of the Breastfeeding Network is a pharmacist run drug information service. So any mum who's asked to take medicine or wants to take medicine um, to do while they're feeding their babies, can contact a team of highly trained pharmacists who will be able to give them the up-to-date research information on whether it's safe or not. Then we come to the Baby Friendly website, lots of information on there. And then The Lancet did two very good um, research series on breastfeeding, and they're well worth a look as well. That's the contact details for the Tower Hamlet's Baby Feeding Service. And then on the other side is the Na National Breastfeeding Helpline, which is run by the Breastfeeding Network and the Association for Breastfeeding Mothers. Um, so I think that's enough for me. <laughs> Sorry that you lost contact with me sometimes. Sorry about that. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. I, I turned off your... Um, no, that's a good camera. idea. Sometimes that makes yeah. it better, doesn't it's it? It seemed to help them um, with the connection a little bit. I'm just going to stop sharing. Um, so thank you so much, Joy. Maybe I should put the video back on so we can see you. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for that, um, Joy. Like, it's so great to see kind of how support in the borough has kind of evolved and developed, developed over time. And... Yeah, it's just so much information. It's amazing, you know, um, and so much like the the amount of support in Tower Hamlets. 
it's just great and it's great that it's continuing and you're continuing to work with women in the borough as well yeah um, we are extremely lucky and actually it was even mentioned in parliament um a couple of years ago that all areas should have a project like the tower hamlets project so i think that was a quite a proud moment when that was said um so yeah it's, it's comprehensive i think and tries to meet the needs of parents in the borough yeah hi i'm genova mum of two local historian and breastfeeding advocate i am also currently breastfeeding with my two-year-old daughter I became a mum at 22 with my first child and felt quite alone in my endeavour to breastfeed as I knew no one my age doing the same. When attending support groups or talking to other breastfeeding mums, they were all much older than me, so our lives were very different in many ways. I was fortunate enough to have support from my mum, also a young breastfeeding mum, when she had me at only 19. We do lead by example and I had a great role model, but times had changed since my mum had my two sisters and I. Fast forward to my second child and I was a single working mum with the added pressures of returning to work after maternity leave. I found it difficult to relate to anyone or compare my situation as anyone I had known to breastfeed either cut back or stopped before returning to the workplace. Breastfeeding can particularly affect a mum's return to work as the separation of mum and baby can lead to various emotional stresses as well as health implications including mastitis in mothers, a painful inflammation of the breast tissue, and weight loss in infants. It can be difficult for partners or family members to understand the pressures or emotional impact mothers can face during this time. It's important for everyone supporting a mother to be as informed about breastfeeding as possible to enable mothers to make choices that best suit them and their baby. Studies show that breastfeeding can promote an emotional bond between mum and baby, despite pressures or difficult times in your life. Judith Marchant, mother and founder of Newham's First Children's Centre, shares her experience of breastfeeding her first child, born in 1959. Can you remember how you felt as a very new parent with your first child? I loved it. And my mother-in-law came up and stayed. Anne was her second grandchild. And the first one, Simon, had been very underweight and very poorly. And Anne was four, eight and a half pounds or something, and very straightforward. And I remember Mum talking about the difference, how big Anne felt. But Mum was very good. She didn't, she let me sort out, let me do it. Um, this is your mother. Yes, yes. She sorted the kitchen and the washing and was just helpful, but she didn't direct me. Um, I was breastfeeding, that worked. And Anne was easy. If you fed her every four hours, that was great. Nothing else. The others were quite different. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved it. Yes, lovely, lovely time. <laughs> It is no secret that breast milk is the best food source for babies. I'm going to stop there because I'm sure that Rose is going to put some links in the chat so you can listen to um, the rest of the podcast episode and all, all the other episodes as well. Um, I don't know if you want to pop some more links in the chat, um, Rosa, before we stop the event or anything you wanted to say. Oops, done it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just thank you for putting this together Genova and thank you for speaking Joy I found it so interesting listening to both of you if people want to listen to more of a podcast I just put a link there yeah um yep thank you everybody I did put um a link to an eva the evaluation form in the chat I hope everybody did get that link um just because we loved your feedback I might put it in again just in case I went to um I Put it in the chat too early um and thank you so much uh rosa and joy for speaking today um yeah it's been great and i've learned a lot <laughs> um but yes uh if that's that's if that's it now i'm gonna say goodbye to everybody and i hope you enjoy your weekend and friday and yeah thank you you too
thank you very much it's very interesting thank you bye <laughs>